more love, more joy, everything. It's inspired young people. Inspiration comes from within you. When you clear out the garbage that's in your mind, you then create space for something better, more beautiful to come in. Let's have life and have it more abundantly. I say yes. It's like taking a workshop. I get to be in my pajamas. We have a very active imagination, which is why it's important to learn how to harness it and then point it in the direction you want to go. I listen to your show every day. It's time now for Living Your Inspired Life with Susan Burrell. Susan is no-nonsense, inspirational, motivational, and fun. This is positive talk radio. Practical wisdom for everyday life. It's a gift you give yourself. Now, here's Susan. And welcome to Living Your Inspired Life. I'm Susan Burrell, and you're listening to News Talk 1590 KVTA. And we have been talking uh, this month about finding our new normal. And this is coming off of an interview I did a few weeks ago with Greg Braden. And so in the process of doing that, I am so excited to have this guest on today because we, this is going to I think just gel everything that we've all the conversations we've been having on living your inspired life to we're going to bring it into coherence. So I want to introduce today's guest, Howard Martin. Howard, thanks for joining me. Susan, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure, and I want to say hello to everyone who's listening to the show today and wishing you well. Thank you. I, I, and I have chills that I'm so excited about us having this conversation because. Uh, just for our listeners, Howard is involved, highly involved, in something called Heart Math, and then Heart Math has also started something called Global Co- Coherence. And so, I want us to, Howard, let's kind of lay down the idea of Heart Math, so then everybody knows where we're going for the global coherence, because that's the thing I really want to talk about. Okay, great. We'd be happy to do that. Well, yeah, I'm executive vice president with HeartMath, and one of the people that helped their founder, Doc Childry, you know, found HeartMath now 23 years ago. What HeartMath is, is we're an organization really relatively large now. We employ about 100 people. We operate all over the world. But what we do is we offer people a system consisting of tools, techniques, and methods, all underpinned with scientific research, designed to help people today, you know, empower themselves and move through these changing times with more flow and more grace. And so that's what we do, and we do it through a variety of ways, as I mentioned. And uh, heart math has, has been my life, really my life's work, and it really is a system that involves looking at uh, accessing more of the qualities of the heart, what we call the intelligence of the heart, in a very practical sense, in a very uh, taking heart out of the respected uh, confines of philosophy and spirituality and putting it into, into daily, daily living. So is that what the, because not being a math person, I, when I hear heart math, I think I'm supposed to be doing times tables and stuff like that. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's it's one of those names that you, you never forget, but you can't quite figure it out. Uh-huh. Generally, you don't see the word math and heart even in the same sentence. No. Much less the same word. Well, if you, if you ask anyone, what does heart mean to you, people are going to say, they have their reference to that. They'll talk about it being a cardiovascular organ, or they'll talk about it being a source of wisdom or love or things like that. The math part of our name just means empirical. We felt when we started Heart Math years ago that we wanted it to have impact in a, in a mainstream societal context. That heart had been talked about for thousands of years. People respected it and understood it some, but it seemed to be written off as philosophical or soft or squishy or, or right. not useful in, in the context of, of the world we live in today. We chose the bridge of science to bridge that understanding into practical living. And the math really doesn't represent like numbers like you're talking about, like tables. It's more like, you know, an empirical understanding, like one plus one equals two. That's empirical. And so we add science. We add some very practical approaches to to manifesting heart. And we end up with with an understanding of heart that's just got a, a more solid baseline to it. So it sounds like when you're saying empirical and, and connecting it with the heart that so there's like scientifically, there's no argument with what you guys the research you guys have done and how the heart and the brain are connected. Is that what yeah, that's I'm hearing? True. I mean, the research that we've done, we've done a huge body of research here. And there's also research for all over the world that was done in similar fields. I think what our scientists did that was brilliant is they put together a very understandable story of how the heart is more than a cardiovascular organ just pumping blood slavishly. It's really an information processing center in our body. And it sends information to the brain and throughout our entire system that's actually critical, you know, for the functioning of us as human beings. 
And that, in and of itself, was just knowledge that we didn't have. And it confirmed a lot of the things that had been said about heart for thousands of years. And it gave it that, again, empirical context that allowed us to then understand it better. Okay, so wait a minute, Howard. I have to take a breath. So what, <laughs> because what I just, what I think I just heard you say, which I love, because that's personally how I operate, is that the heart is the information center and not the brain. And it, because scientists, it seems to me, over the, you know, the centuries have thought, or, or at least it's become that way in the last 20, the 20th century and now the 21st century, where science is the thing that knows, as opposed to the heart. So what you're saying is the heart is the, th- is the intelligence. Well, it's both. I mean, obviously the brain is this magnificent organ that processes, analyzes, and stores information. And it's, just, it's, just, it's an amazing part of who we are. So definitely it's an information center. What we're saying with heart is that heart also is an information processing center. It sends information, for example, to the brain through a nervous system that exists within the heart itself. It's studied through a very mainstream field called neurocardiology. Mm -hmm. This nervous system sends information through a nerve pathway that starts out in the heart and then goes up into the brain, into the lower uh, centers of the brain, then right in through the mid-level brain where a lot of our emotional processing takes place and then terminates all the way up in the higher perceptual centers of the brain. And so who knew this, right? You know, right. That, this, that the heart was doing this. When researchers map out the neurological traffic in our bodies, they can clearly see that the heart is sending a lot more information to the brain than it ever gets from the brain. Oh, wow. So there's a two-way c- conversation taking place, but the heart's doing most of the talking. And so this is just one example of things that the research uh, discovered. And, you know, we hear these terms like listen to your heart, follow your heart, things like that. Well, now you have at least a data point based on real hard science showing that the heart is actually sending information that you can listen to. So is that connected to um, our – so, like – I do a lot of intuitive things, you know, and it feels like it's coming uh, sort of from my brain, but – so it sounds like it's more coming through the heart? Well, here's what I think. And, you know, I think that information comes into us in a variety of different ways. We are actually access a field of information, you know, that's sometimes called consciousness and things like that. And it's that field of information that we draw from to create what we think is real, what's not, you know, what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, uh, the psychological paradigms that underpin how we live and how we believe. Now... That information is interpreted by the brain, that's for sure. That's where, we, that's where it shows up as thoughts, and that's where it shows up as visual images, and yeah. that's where we have sounds and things. The question then becomes, where does that information come from? Is it all coming from just in the brain, or is it, are we picking it up different ways? So here's my belief, based upon the science, but it's still a belief, is that we are accessing this field of information, and um, the more refined aspects of that information are being accessed through the heart. That information is sent at super high speed to the brain, at the speed of thought or the speed of consciousness, to the brain where it's then then interpreted. But the source or impetus for a lot of that information that you called, for example, and it relates to heart, intuition, actually is accessed through the heart, not just through the brain. If you think about intuition, for example, it's, it's kind of knowing what you know without knowing how you know it. Right. It bypasses all the sort of logical linear steps that we often you know, need to make decisions. But it, 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 it sometimes shows up not just as, as thoughts. It's more like, what do we feel? Yeah. The feeling we have inside of, like, don't do that right now. <laughs> right, it's exactly. Sensing, it's a sensing that we have. My belief is that the heart is that sensory organ that gives us the ability to tap into that type of intuitive information that shows up in the ways I just described. So uh, so let's move a little bit forward now, Howard, with um, how is the heart math modality or the ideas of heart math? Now, you guys, are, you've started something called global coherence, and I want to, I want to, I want our listeners to hear what that is, because I'm excited about it. Yeah, well, it's called the Global Coherence Initiative, and it's something we started about five years ago. It's an organization that people can join for free just by going to the website um, that brings together people from all around the world to use their heart-focused care and their intention behind that to help, you know, create a world that's more harmonious in nature with less conflict and stress and things like that. So it's using, you know, the collective power and intelligence of, of the heart amongst all the people that are members, to really influence the consciousness field itself. 
in, in a way of service, in a way of sort of bringing about a new world that functions in a, in a, in a much more harmonious and enjoyable way. Here's why we created it. Here at HeartMath, we've done a lot of work in a lot of different areas, and we've done very, very mainstream work. We work in Fortune 100 companies, all four branches of the U.S. military, school systems, universities, all kinds of places, and we do it around the world. I'll just give you one example. Every police, every person in the police force in the Netherlands gets heart math training. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that amazing? I think that's wonderful. That's things like that. You know, so we've done very mainstream work. Now, we go back and recognize, you know, when we were young and before we ever started heart math, it was about a belief that we had. It was about wanting to serve, and it, was, it, had, it had, you know, for lack of a better term, a spiritual component to it, that we believed that we could do something with our lives. We believe that we had a power within us that could help other people and, and create positive changes in the world. So after you know a long, long time of doing heart math and doing a lot of the mainstream things that I just described and all the scientific research and all of that, we felt it was time to bring that component back in again. And that's why we created the Global Coherence Initiative. So there are literally thousands of, of organizations and groups around the world, all different kinds, that are doing things like synchronous activities where they get together, say, online, or where they call times when everybody's going to pray or do some form of meditation or something right. to help create a positive impact. So we decided, well, we'll do our part as well. So I applaud all those other organizations that are doing that. I think that's important. Now, we also are heart math, so we brought science to the party as well. <laughs> and so our scientists have developed technology that can measure sensitive changes occurring in what's called the Earth's energetic fields. Oh, wow. And let me explain those, if I may. You know, the Earth, is, Earth produces energetic fields. They're part of the Earth as a, as a living system. You can think about them maybe as an energetic ecology. There are two primary fields. One, everybody kind of has heard the name of. It's the geomagnetic field. It's what a compass measures, for example. Uh-huh. And so, you know, that's the geomagnetic field is constantly fluctuating and changing. There's another field that works for the geomagnetic field. It starts just above the top of the atmosphere and goes about 120 miles up in space. And it's called the ionosphere. And these two, two, two fields provide a protective layer around the planet that uh, protects us from, you know, incoming space weather. You know, solar radiation, solar flares, cosmic rays, things like that. If the fields weren't there, there could be no life on planet Earth. They protect us in a way that allows life to take place. Uh -huh. So they're very important parts of the Earth. Now, these fields, as I mentioned, are constantly fluctuating and changing all the time. And there's been lots of science already done and more ongoing, definitively showing that changes that take place in these fields create changes in us. That human health and behavior individually and societally are linked to changes occurring in the Earth's energetic fields. So the fields are affecting us. Now, our scientists have developed technology that can measure changes occurring in these fields, and we're putting you know, uh, coherence monitoring systems at various places, various points around the world. Eventually, they want 12 sites so they can study the fields in their entirety. Right now, we have four working sites, and, and as we speak, yeah, those sites are inputting information and data back to our research labs. We have one uh, in Northern California. We have a sensor site in Northern Canada. We have a site in Lithuania. Wow. And we have a site in Saudi Arabia. Oh, my gosh. The fifth site will go into New Zealand very soon, and then one following that will be uh, South Africa. So we'll have Southern Hemispheric sites very soon. Why do we have these? Well, we're studying these fields. We're we're learning more about them, and we'll be able to make contributions to the academic literature as we go, based on what we, what we see and what we learn. We're also studying the effects these fields have on us as human beings. But here's where it gets interesting. We also have a hypothesis. We believe that mass human emotion, whether that be positive or negative, could very well be having an impact on these fields. Okay, wait, I, Howard, I want you to say that again. Just the way you said it, so everybody can hear it. We believe that mass human emotion, whether that be positive or negative, could very well have a measurable impact on these fields. I so agree with you, and I'm not a scientist, but I, I, I see it in my personal life that, you know, the positive or the negative emotion affects my circumstances 
all the time. When, when, once I became aware that that's what was happening. Yeah, you know, well, new science is showing that we are all connected energetically. Yeah. All living systems are connected energetically on this planet and beyond, really. And there's some great science that's, 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 that's showing that to be true. So that puts us in a little different perspective on what we are doing with our lives. I believe that, you know, every thought, every feeling that we have puts out an energetic component. And that we live in this field of consciousness that is not just, what it's doing is that field of consciousness is reflecting back to us, not just what we think. Yep. But especially what we feel in our hearts. Yeah. And through interfacing with that field, we have some, some we have more ability than people realize at creating our life. It's a co-creative process of creating what we want in our lives. So, uh, so heart math has some exercises, yes, to give, is there an exercise you could give our listeners right now, just so they can have an understanding of how that emotion within them co-creates? Yeah, I can sure do that. I mean, as I mentioned in the top of our our program today, heart math is a system really of tools, techniques, and methods, all underpinned with science. We even have technology we've developed to help people learn to develop these aspects within themselves. And there are techniques within that system, of course, that we teach in our training programs. We teach, we teach others to be trainers, and we teach people to be coaches, and we, we train in the places I mentioned earlier. But the one that I can share on a program like today that's easy enough to, to, to translate for everyone and something we can all do together right now is a technique called the quick coherence technique. Quick coherence, okay. Coherence is a, is a highly ordered state. You know, that, that when we're in coherence, we're healthier, we're smarter, we relate to life better. And uh, the quick coherence technique is a three-step process that gets us into coherence quickly. I like it because it's, it's got a great utility. I can do it anytime, anywhere. And I can use it to bring myself back to a more balanced place, especially when life has, you know, presented something for me that, you know, that sort of takes me out of that place. Oh, yeah, those curveballs. <laughs> and that happens to everybody all the time now. It's, yeah. It's, and so this is a useful technique for that, and it's also a useful technique for preparing for things, just like I did it um, a few minutes before we started our show today so that I could be the, the best Howard Martin I could be for you and your listeners. So let me share that with you now, if I may, and with everyone listening. It's a simple three-step process. We'll do it together. Okay. You can do this with your eyes closed. Uh, Sometimes that's helpful uh, when you're learning something. If you're in your car right now, obviously don't do that. (laughs) But um, here's the way it works. Step one is called heart focus. What I'd like you to do is to focus your attention right now in the area in the center of your chest, the area of the heart. Okay. Feel the attention go right there. Yeah. You put your hand there if you, if you need to. The second step is called heart-focused breathing. Breathe naturally and normally. Don't force it, but breathe a little deeper than you normally would. And as you're breathing, I want you to pretend as if the breath is flowing in and out right through the area where you have your attention, the area of the heart, the center of the chest. So inhale now and feel the breath coming in right through the heart. That feels good. And exhale and send it right back out. (sighs) Now, what I want you to do next is the third and most important step. You maintain your heart-focused breathing, and now I'd like you to to feel a positive emotion as best you can. You don't have to force it. A positive emotion would be something like the appreciation you have for the good things in your life. Just feel that appreciation. Or it might be the feeling, let's say, of love or care you have for someone or something in your life. Maybe it's for your significant other or your child or your grandchild or a pet or a special place that you go to that you really love and care about. So do that hard-focused breathing, and as you do it, feel that positive emotion. And we'll do that now for maybe about 10 or 15 seconds. (sighs) Ah. That's, so it's really that simple. That's good. I that's so good. I and I so appreciate you walking everybody through that. So and this is like one of the systems you have taught. You said the earlier the armed forces and and a police group in the Netherlands or oh, something. Yeah, all over the world, really. And, and, so why are pe- aren't more people doing that? Do you well, know? Well, you know, it's 
it's like anything else, and you know, it takes time to integrate things in. People have to come to it in their own way. Um, there are, again, I think people are looking for answers within themselves now. I think they're looking for more peace and quiet in the storm. So heart math is growing, and it has has been all these years. But people are, you know, I guess the the answer to that question would be there's so much stimulation in the world today. Oh, yeah. The roar of ambition and survival is so loud that we sometimes lose contact with the heart. We began to live life from the neck up. Mm -hmm. And we lose a connection to something that's our birthright, really. Something that's a core part of who we are as human beings. And so with all the stimulation going on, all the problems, all the media, and all the, you know, just everything is just pounding us all the time. Sometimes people just get so overloaded, they don't want to do anything. It's just too stressful. So they just go through life in a sort of mechanical way, surviving rather than thriving. Yeah. And it's just endemic. I mean, you know, you see that reflected in statistics of all kinds. And uh, it's an unfortunate situation that we're in now, one that I do think is getting better, and, and I, by the way, I'm a very hopeful person about these things, but I do think we live in a, in a world now where, at least in the Western societies, where approximately one-third of us are actually suffering from some form of low-grade anxiety and depression. Yes. And that's just common. It's become standard. It's almost like the water that the fish swims in. They don't even notice it anymore. And so that's a, a bit of an unfortunate situation. But then again, there are more and more people who are, who, are, who are moving on. They're, in a sense, and I hate to use this term because it makes it sound like some people are good and some aren't, but some people are waking up, in a sense, waking up to what's inside themselves and what they can do, and they're finding ways and creative solutions to their problems. So the resilience of the human, human being is an amazing thing that constantly inspires me of what people can do and the magnificent things that people do in their lives, and not just overcoming challenges, but in term, terms of the things that they are able to create and understand and then, and, and then share with others. All of that's, you know, the, the upside of, of the world that we live in today that I think sometimes doesn't get enough notice because we see the problems so clearly. Well, you know, it's interesting, Howard, because, uh, you know, the the conversation that I'm having in a lot of the in groups that I'm involved with is that it, it, everything is happening so quickly, and and then there's and we're witnessing uh, planetary devastation, you know, like with the Philippines, and and then what's happening now in Russia and the Ukraine in different levels, right? And and everybody's concerned about it, and so that that. Uh, stress and depression you're talking about is kind of, it, it seems like with what you've just explained, could that be feeding some of what is happening on the planet? I believe it is. Wow. Now, like I said, I think that every thought and feeling that we have is being reflected back to us in a way. So if yeah. we're walking around feeling uh, depressed or even sorry for ourselves or scared about what we're hearing on the news, that is reverberating. It is. So then it's part of that co-creative process of then uh, uh, what you're feeling then creates that experience, and then you have, which fuels more of that negative feeling, to put a label yeah. on it. but That would be true, and I think the thing we have to realize, too, is like if we, we're going to have those feelings. And so anyone who's listening right now, for example, has been having those feelings or is having a bad day today, it's not to, to be down on yourself about that. We're living in a time that you just mentioned, Susan, where it's an un unprecedented amount of change happening in a short amount of time. Yeah. So the speed of change is accelerating, and that provides challenges for everyone, including me. And I think we have to be, be more compassionate with ourselves and recognize we're doing the best we can and that you know we're going to have times when we're going to feel certain things that we know we don't want to feel, and it's okay. And then also you know, tap into that core power within ourselves, which I say is hard and then use it to gently move ourselves out of that. But if we go into to a place where, that you were just describing, where we recognize we've been down, we've been sad, we've been upset, we've been this, that, and the other, and then we get upset that we've been upset and all that, it's just a downward spiral. Yeah, and it's hard to get out of that pit it of needs despair. To be interrupted, and to me, the interrupter is the heart. It's always there. It's waiting for us. It's our own best friend. Yeah. And it's there waving its hand going, you who I'm here. You know? <laughs> when you want to slow down for a minute, we can have a chat, and I think I can help you out here. You know, And it just requires a little bit of slowing down and acknowledging you know, uh, that part of ourselves. And we do that sometimes, but usually it's after we've, we're, we've got ourselves backed up against the wall. 
Oh, yeah. It's almost like I was reading something about the cosmic hammer that it has to come down sometimes on people uh, to to wake you up. It's like you have to have, well, we don't have to, but there seems to be a belief system in the world that you have to have a shock, which is a rude awakening, really, before you can start to pay attention that, hey, what, how I've been living my life or the way I've been participating in that particular thing is not healthy for me or the other people I, I'm with. Yeah, and that's true. It often is that's the way that it is. What I would say somewhere down the road in the evolution of us, in my hopeful perspective, is I hope we get to a place where the rule of no pain, no gain disappears. Oh, yeah. That we find ways that we evolve and grow without the hammer having to come down on us. You know? It's so funny you said no pain, no gain, because I have that similar, I agree with you, Howard, no pain, no gain, that needs to be eradicated. And I have a, I work out uh, with a trainer, and um, and he's a, younger than me, a young guy. So he, he keeps telling me, if it doesn't hurt, it's not working. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> I don't want to be in pain. I want to I want to become efficient and I want to become stronger, but I don't want to be in pain. Yeah, I think the same thing's true with our, with our growth as, as the human beings yeah. and emotionally and that sort of thing as well. Is that we, We're moving to a place where we have more conscious choice and we can avoid a lot of that by, by the choices that we make. And then there'll be times in our life when we're going to be faced with some challenges, and they're designed to really give us, you know, some some new impetus to move on. But it doesn't always have to be that way. Right. At least we, at this point, I'm I'm certain that we can all wrap the hammer with velvet right now. Oh, I like and, that. And make it a lot less uh, intense when stuff does come down. Yeah, and then pretty sh- soon it'll just be like a little fairy godmother wand. Yeah, tap on the shoulder. That's right. Hello. <laughs> like you said, the heart saying, hello, I'm right here. There you go. So, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the um, interconnectedness that we have heart to heart. Yeah, well, here's what's interesting. You know, one of the go back to the to the science for a minute, if I may. One of the things about the heart is it's, it's an electrical organ. Oh, I like that. It produces by far the strongest source of bioelectricity that we have. It's about forty to sixty times stronger than the second most powerful source, which happens to be the brain. Now, you think about it this way. When we go get our electrocardiogram, what are they measuring? They're measuring electricity produced by the heart. Mm -hmm. And they place electrodes around our chest. They get a signal, and the doctor looks at the signal and determines something about the health of our heart. But it's an electrical signal that they're picking up. Well, it turns out, of course, that that this electricity produced by the heart actually permeates every single cell in our body. Every single cell is being flooded with this, this electrical information. But here's where it gets really fun. The heart actually produces an electromagnetic field that surrounds us in 360 degrees and extends beyond our skin out into space about three to four feet. I'm not talking about something like an aura or anything. I'm talking about very measurable electromagnetic energy, kind of like radio waves. I love that you're bringing this up. I literally saw a picture of this two days ago. I love the synchronicity. Okay, so go on. Anyway, we have this field, and it's electromagnetic in nature. It surrounds us in 360 degrees. It it radiates beyond our skin out into space. Now, the information in the field, the frequencies that are in that field, they will change all the time. And here's what changes them, what we're feeling. That's what changes the field. Wow. In other words, if we are experiencing frustration or anger, things like that, when we look at that in our research labs, we can see that it's producing a very incoherent field. It's called the scientists actually called it an incoherent spectra. It's a whole lot of frequencies, but they're all jumbled and ragged, and they're fighting for the available power and things like that. Uh huh. When we switch and we start experiencing emotions that are associated with the concept of heart, like care, appreciation, things that we just did in our little exercise, or love, or compassion, those kind of feelings, the field changes. It produces what scientists call a coherent spectra. The frequencies are ordered. They're working harmoniously together. They're not fighting. So what's happening is we are literally broadcasting this information triggered by our emotions, first of all to our cells, to every single cell in our body, but we're also broadcasting it out. We're sending that information out. Now, when you remove the boundaries of Newtonian physics from this equation, so Thank you. And you put in uh, quantum physics, then you take away the boundaries of time and space. Then the implications of how these fields are relating 
to the fields of all over the planet and even the universe become uh, possible to explore. So the inquiry that we have today at HeartMath is around things like how does the field of the heart send information to the field in the brain? How does my heart relate to the heart of another energetically? Is there a collective heart uh, being created right now between you and I, Susan, even though we're not together, and between you and I and everyone who's listening to the show right now? Mm -hmm. I think so. Well, that's what we're looking at. That's the implications of it all, is that we are creating these fields and that what we feed these fields with has everything to do with our emotions. So I'm going to create a line of T-shirts that has a little statement that says, feed the field. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, so as you were just describing all that, Howard, I got, uh, I was also hearing the, that this electromagnetic field that is measurable and that's affected by our emotions is, you know, okay, sorry, I'm, I jumped at myself. When people are facing a life-threatening disease, like, say, cancer, and, and, and years ago, the whole thing about visualizing the cancer cells dying and visualizing all of this, you know, it was so prominent in that, mm-hmm. at least for the alternative healing uh, modalities. And now it's probably part of all the cancer stuff. But so what you were describing with the electromagnetic field, that's why visualization works, Yes. It has a lot to do with it. Where we, when we begin to focus, we begin to change the actual, you know, energetic information from the heart that's going to every single cell in our own body. Mm-hmm. So there could be some implications to that as well in terms of healing. There are a lot of health practitioners that work with heart math. You know, we have we have a, a very large database of people. But there's a subset in that database of just pure health professionals that use heart math, and there's over twenty thousand of them. My goodness, I, why wouldn't everybody be doing this? Well, oh, I do. I mean, your medicine's obviously a huge, a great big old giant, you know, system that has to go through its own evolution. Yeah. But there are a lot. But, you know, there's different kinds of ways that the health practitioners use it. And, you know, certainly very mainstream ones that are doing cardiovascular type of work and things like that. But there are, are alternative uh, health people as well. And they really get it that, you know, uh, what they can do energetically, not just in some mystical way, but, you know, in a very pragmatic way, as demonstrated through the type of research that we do, can have an impact on a patient. And I think that, you know, the first thing I would say, if anybody listening now happens to be a health professional, and hopefully you would agree, is that to be the very best health professional you need to be, you need to have the, the clearest, cleanest energetic field you can have as you treat as you treat others oh absolutely it has a lot to do with the effectiveness of that unfortunately you know health doesn't always work that way we had a a consultant one time that came in and did a presentation for us and one of the things he said that i've noticed ever since was he said watch what happens today when you go to the doctor he or she never touches you oh you're right they look at your x-ray and they say now go down and get this medication or we're going to have to do this procedure but they may have sh- shook your hand when they came in the room, but there was no other contact. Mm-hmm. And I started noticing that, a little kidney stone problem. And the guy came in, he looked at my x-ray, he told me, we're going to have to do so-and-so, let's schedule it. And he walked out of the room. Yeah. <laughs> and we never had a physical interaction. And yet medicine should be about really understanding from the physician's standpoint what's happening inside that person's body. So the, the technology component of it is fabulous. But I think we also need to to add back in some of the personal and also the energetic components of that in order to create wholeness healing in people. Right. And the heart based. Yeah. You know, it's so I I appreciate you sharing all this, Howard, because um, my personal practice lately has been about uh, embodying love and sending it to all the cells of my my body. Uh huh to improve my health because I've been under a lot of stress, personal stress. And it's, it's taken a while, but literally, I mean, it's taken several weeks, but literally I felt a shift and it was because of focusing everything you're talking about. And I didn't even know I was doing heart math, but everything you're talking about of focusing from the heart center that, and, and aligning with the electrical system in my body and things like that. And it really has improved my well-being. You know, it's a really healthy thing to do. Uh, if you, if anyone has a health problem, it's a good thing to do. And also, if you don't have a health problem, it's a great preventative thing to do. I want to add on to that, if I may, and I'm, I haven't been faced myself with a really serious health crisis, so maybe I'm a little talking a little out of turn here. But I'll let people, you know if you're talking out of turn. Okay, so people who have, you know, that I've talked to and, and talked about, they said that where the real healing began is where they weren't fighting it anymore. Mm. 
you know, they weren't trying to kill the cancer cell. That's a big deal. You know, they were accepting, they were sending it love, you know what I mean, but they weren't trying to kill it. You know, this whole concept of fighting cancer or fighting a disease, it's still got fight in it, right? Yep. And so it's a certain place of balance in between that where you have the intentionality of it getting better, but you also are not, you know, aggressing it so that, you know, you're fighting something. You know, it's a real interesting paradigm shift. And I've talked to the people who have gone through major crises, who've overcome brain tumors and overcome, you know, uh, accidents where they were told they're never going to walk again and all that. And in every single case, they, they would talk to me in ways that they began to go back to the place that created them in the first place. And they began to accept with where they were today with the hope and intention that it could get better. But there was a, an acceptance in there that was really the key that began to shift what happened to them in, in regards to their health. So let's extrapolate that, Howard, out into uh, the, the, the shift because you were talking about the aggressive yeah. Instead of being aggressive with the cancer, you know, which is off what they use a lot, the aggressive chemotherapy or whatever it is, let's extrapolate that out into the human being realm of me against you or, you know, us against them. And that aggressive thing that seems to be occurring in so many places on the planet right now. That's true. Especially Russia and the UK- Ukraine. Yeah, well, you know, there is a, a major shift happening in the way the world functions, but everything takes time. Nothing's overnight. But, you know, the overall momentum is towards cooperation rather than competition. Yes. And so there's a new world in a way, and character, I could characterize it many different ways, but there's a new world sort of birthing itself right in the midst of the old one. And the old one has been there for a long time, and it's not bad. I'm not trying to say it's bad. Look at the wonderful things that have been created in our world, right? Yeah, absolutely. Amazing, you know. And yet there's new coming in. So you have the old that's there, and it doesn't want to go away. You have the new sort of pushing out. So you have the the new one pushing against the old one. And where they meet, you have this friction. And the friction is what we see. So when we see what's going on, let's say this is Russia and Crimea right now, there's friction, right? We see that friction. There's something new trying to birth itself in the midst of old. The old's pushing back, right? And so you have this conflict that's going on. And so there's a fear that comes up with that about, you know, where is this going to lead? You know, is this going to put us back into the Cold War? I know. That's what everybody's talking about. I I just had a conversation with somebody who who understands and practices everything we talk about in Living Your Inspired Life and what you're talking about with HeartMath. And this person said, I'm afraid. And I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. It's the Cold War again. It's not. But here's what I like people to consider listening right now. Go, when you can, to the Global Coherence Initiative website. Which is glcoherence.org. There you'll see a place where we do what's called care focuses. There's actually a global care room you can go to where you see where you are on a globe and where other people are on a globe, the little markers that are on that globe uh, where your Internet provider address is. So you see that there's people all over there that are actually in there with you right now. Oh, wow. And every month we do a care focus, and we focus it on specific things often, or, you know, it could be generalist things that are big problems, but sometimes specific things where we are asking people, just put more heart-focused care and intention out towards seeing resolution on these things. This month is about these type of conflicts. And I'll read just a, just a little bit. i got the site up now. It says, for example, the ongoing toll of the civil war in Syria. That's another one, right? Yep. Is creating suffering for many millions, as are the brutal civil wars that continue to rage in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, a potent civil war in the Ukraine is increasing global tensions as pro-Russian forces have invaded the Crimea region of the Ukraine. Crimea rejects the, uh, the pro-European Ukrainian government and has scheduled a referendum, which by now has already happened, right? Right. They voted on it. You know, it happened you know, a couple of days ago. European countries in the United States are, are, are implementing economic sanctions against Russia, and there's a concern of a new Cold War. It is important for world peace that the crisis be resolved diplomatically. Let's send our prayers and our hard energy for the highest, best outcome possible in the Ukraine and the people in other areas of suffering from civil wars. That's the kind of things that we do. I love that. And that's a monthly thing that people can go yeah. to or they get inf- informed about. Yeah, and then if they it goes sign on up. with an exercise, which I won't do right now, but it's an exercise that you do. And, you know, there's someone leading you through that through an audio recording. 
Awesome. It leads you through there, so you can do that. But really, we're just saying that you can use your heart, focus, care, and intention right now. Let's try to stay out of the fear and the projections. So let's talk a little bit about that too, Howard, because um, what you just described from what you were reading off of the glcoherence.org site could sound a little, you know, when you were, you're talking about the highest uh, good, the highest resolution. Highest best outcome, yeah. Yeah, highest best outcome. Um, some people say the uh, the highest truth. Um, yeah. For for some people that have not been practicing this, or, or maybe are just now becoming aware of it, it, it could sound kind of airy fairy, right? It could. I think one way to look at it from a pragmatic sense is a lot of times we just don't know all the things that are involved in going on or the implications thereof. Mm-hmm. It happens even in our personal lives. We think we know something. We think we know what's best for someone or whatever, and we go through a whole lot to try to get that done and find that it really wasn't best for them at all. You know? Right. If there was something else in their life that was, you know, that needed to happen, this was a good thing for them, right? So I don't know with the Crimea and Ukraine. That's a, that's a part of the world that I'm not in, and I, I don't know a tremendous amount about it. Uh, I don't know what's best and what's not best. All I know is that the tension that's going on there is not a good thing, you know? Well, and the, and and it's not a good thing because of what we were talking about earlier about how it affects the the planet's atmospheric stuff that yeah. you're measuring and how it affects people's coherence. Yeah, well, just break it down a second. I mean, if you think about it, and when I look at the news, and all I'm getting is what everybody else is getting, mm-hmm. what they give me in the news. But you know, you have Russia invades Crimea, and everybody looks at that as a bad thing, and yet the people in Crimea have voted that they want to be with Russia, you know? Right. So who's right, who's wrong? I don't know. You know? All I know is that I don't want this to go into a Cold War, you know? So but when we're sending heart energy for the highest, best outcome, um, is that like forcing our will on the people of Russia and Crimea? Or, I mean... It's just saying, let's, whatever whatever the most harmonious result would be, let's 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 see that happen. And for me, it's not about whether they, whether Crimea stays with Russia or goes with Ukraine. You know, it's not about that. It's about what's going to be best. What's going to create the most harmony? What's really going to be best for the people? And Without prevent, our opinion on it, what's going to prevent ongoing conflict? That would be highest best. But I've got my own version of highest best. Everyone listening probably has theirs. You know, right? So I try to be more neutral about how things come out. I just want to put my heart out to it so that the best possible thing that can happen has a chance. In a harmonious way. So resolving all of it in a harmonious way. Because, you know, I I work with a lot of clients and and they have that kind of a question. Well, is that... Is that me putting my will? Well, I think it should be this way. You know, they they have an opinion on how whatever is going on in their life should be resolved. But like you said earlier, there comes a place where you have got to let it go, uh, wanting the desired outcome your way so that the best can happen. I think it's important to have our opinions, and I think it's important to stand up for them, but I also think that there's a place of neutrality that, that actually needs to be added into that in many cases. Now, that's a hard thing. Unfold. And it's not easy to do, but, you know, strong, strong judgmental opinions, usually based on lack of information in many cases, just don't ever get the job done. Well, I, I, I believe me, personally, that's what I think we're seeing in all of these different situations around the world, is that that's what's creating, fueling the conflict. Yeah, it's true. I mean, if you look at consciousness in general, it's permeated so much with judgment about what people say is right or wrong or good or bad. And, you know, there's so much prejudicial information that we base those things on. That one of the lifelong things that I'd, I've been working on my whole life and will till it's over is, is, is reducing the amount of judgment I have. I don't think it serves anything. It creates separation. It doesn't really benefit me. It doesn't benefit others. That doesn't mean I walk around blindly just, you know, accepting everything. But there's a certain way it feels inside of me, and um, I try to, to take as much judgment out as I can because that judgment's really a prison for me. Oh, yeah. It locks me into my own belief system and doesn't allow me to see things in a new way, and therefore growth flows. And I'm all about trying to, to continually grow. So, you know, working on judgment and taking out some of the ones that just aren't necessary is a good thing for me. And I, I think it's good for everybody. I do think that part of the problem we have in the world today is that we've just become conditioned uh, where 
expert judgment is a mechanical process. Yeah, it's uh, it's automatic. Automatic. We don't even think about it. Right, and then and then we get into situations and wonder how we got there. Yeah, I was walking down the street with my with the my book agent one day in New York City, and we were talking about these things, and I said. For the next five minutes, let's don't say anything, just listen. So we're in, in Manhattan, right? Mm. And all around us, all we were hearing was people talking about somebody else, you know, judging somebody else. It's all we were hearing the whole time. And so, well, they shouldn't be doing so. Have you heard what they said about so-and-so? Well, I think that's just not right. You know, but, and, and the conversations all around us was like this, 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 this little roar of judgment. Yeah. That's, you know, we... As you're talking about that, and I'm trying to picture you guys walking the streets of Manhattan and hearing all that, I was also thinking about the electromagnetic field that we're all in. And so, so other, so let me ask you this then: How do other people's judgment or other people's em- emotions affect us? Because if you're not conscious, or if we're not consciously aware of where our boundaries are, so to speak, I mean, I, I don't. Are you following what I'm saying, Howard? Yeah, well, there's an obvious effect, you know, but at the same time, let's just flip it around, if I may, and it's just a little complicated. Let's flip it around. The more solid we are within ourselves, the more connected we are to the intelligence of our heart, the more coherent we are within ourselves, the more we create our own energetic field that's less influenced by others. Oh, I love it. I love it. So, you know, for me, I mean... For any of us, let's say I you know, have to go into the airport and go through a whole lot of people in the airport. And I'm involved. There's a whole lot of different energies in that airport, right? Yep. All kinds of people feeling and thinking all kinds of things. Whether they're judging me or not doesn't matter. There's still this, this huge energetic field of a lot of stuff going on. Well, the the more coherent I am, the less it's going to bother me. If I go in there with a bad attitude, if I'm tired, if I don't want to be traveling right now, all those kind of things, then all that stuff starts to irritate me more. Yep. If I go in there with a you know with a balanced, loving, caring attitude about things, appreciative that I'm getting ready to go somewhere and all that, then whatever happens just doesn't have the same impact. So yeah, all that stuff impacts us. But we are in a position in the world today where self responsibility is at the very forefront of everything that we do. And so I have to put it back on myself and not blame it on you know the airport, for example. Right. I have to say it's me that needs to make the change, and I have the power to do that. And I think that's you know one of the main things about our show today that you know, I think is important to share is that we have this magnificent power and intelligence within us that can and does lift us beyond our problems, even in the midst of chaos and confusion. As we learn to recognize it more, as we tune into it, as we respect it, as we take it out of, you know again, the confines of philosophy and spirituality, and we then apply it in daily living, with a meaningful attitude, a genuineness, then we can make changes in our lives, and then we can overcome a lot of the things that would be an influence us, including other people. So is that part of, um, I, I'm hearing a lot of people lately talk about being resilient and persevering and being resilient, which has always felt hard for me. So is that part of what is resilience, what plays into it, what you just described? Resilience is an energy we accumulate that allows us to maintain our equilibrium better in the face of life's adversities. It also gives us the ability to bounce back quicker once something has taken us out. And so it's both. It's, you know, it's, uh, resilience is, is what gives us the ability to overcome things. But it isn't just about something gets us and then we got to bounce back. Something gets us and we got to bounce back. As we learn to increase our resilience reservoir, so to speak, things affect us less. We sort of move through the density and stress of life, almost like we have a little snowplow thing on the front, just pushing it out of the way. Boy, I'm really hoping that's the truth there, Howard. I really am, because so many people, myself included, that that it does feel like you're getting the cosmic hammer, and then you got to stand back up. And I like the idea that resilience is building a reservoir. I love that. And resilience comes from the heart. <laughs> Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So, Howard, um, we're getting close to our our end time, but let's talk a, a little bit more. I want to dry. I want people to go to heartmath.com and check out what we've been talking about today. Yeah, dot com or dot org. This uh, we have a nonprofit and a for profit, so you'll see different information on the sites. And there's things you can get for free. You can also learn how to get trained, or if you wanted to be a trainer, or if you're a coach and you want to use Heart Math in your business or a health professional that wants to implement some of these things. All that stuff's there. Uh, and then, of course, Global Coherence Initiatives, where you can join. If you don't want to do any of that, you can, you can at least um, be part of something where we're just using 
uh, a quality we all have, which is our heart, to help create a better world. Okay. And uh, did you say the website? On heartmath.com or .org. Right. And global co- coherence. GL coherence. Dot org. Yeah, I know that's hard with the Southern Boy accent for people to understand it. So <laughs> No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> so um, we have a few more minutes, Howard. What else What else do we want our listeners to know today? Well, I think that, you know, we've said a lot of it. I, I'll recap a little bit, you know, that we live in, in a time period of unprecedented change, and that provides a lot of challenges but also great opportunities. We have the ability now to rewrite our future, and to create a new world, not only for ourselves, but for generations to come. And I think we're at important choice points right now where that, that there are things that are taking place that we need to, to take a deeper look at. The okay. process is unfolding. It's going on over a period of time. There are no overnight changes, but things are happening very, very quickly. The main service and the main contribution that I believe we all make is the one we make where we learn to better regulate our own emotions and make choices to put out more love and care and those kind of things as we live our our ordinary lives. The external things we do in our businesses and our emissions and how we do things with, uh, you know, socially and all that, they're important, but they're actually secondary to what we do from the inside out. Whether Whether I ever did another interview or not or wrote another book or got on another stage, is not as important. That stuff's not as important as am I continuing to try to be a better Howard Martin every day? And am I putting out more love and more care you know, today than I did yesterday? I was writing a chapter for an upcoming new book uh, not long ago, and it was about you know, the reality of love. And at the end, I basically said you know, that at the end of the day, it's not going to be about how many books I sold or how many uh, people I um, you know, was on a stage in front of. It's going to be about how much did I love or how much did I not love. Oh, my God. I got chills when you said that. I just, I, that is truth, I think. Truth for each and every individual here on the planet right now. Yeah, I think so. And, and through, through the, you know, through trying to manifest as much of that as we can, we'll make better choices. And as we make better choices, we, in fact, rewrite our future. And we are doing it together as people, literally millions and millions of people all around the world who are involved in, in this kind of thinking and trying to make the changes in their lives. So we do have challenges. Time's going to get tough. There's going to be some things I'm, I'm sure coming up in, in the future of our world that are going to be disconcerting. The last thing I want to say is never lose that connection to your heart and never lose your hope that you have a power within you that can help you rise above whatever comes your way and that we, the planet, and humanity are headed in the right direction. Oh, my gosh, Howard. Thank you so much. We've been talking with Howard Martin of... Uh, Heart Math and Global Coherence Initiative. Howard, I, w- I can't wait to see what happens next. Thank you so much for joining us on Living Your Inspired Life. And if, if you missed anything on our show, go to livingyourinspiredlife.org and get tuned in and tuned up. So we're just going to end today with, and so it is, namaste.